Hello, everyone. Um, I will begin by saying that if you have been in the sessions throughout the past couple of days, and in particular the NGO session uh, today, you've probably heard um, quite a bit about drug policy and the impact it has in young people and children. Uh, and I, on that note, I would like to start by thanking both the IDPC Transform and the campaign uh, on counting the cost of war for opening up a space for an actual young person to speak uh, around all these policies that affect our lives rather than keep on hearing other people that don't necessarily know uh, how these policies impact their youth in their different countries, uh, keep talking about them. I entitled uh, the presentation Counting the Costs in Latin America uh, because I want to very quickly give a, an overview of the different drug policies that are currently used in Latin America, and then I will focus at the end uh, a little bit more in the case of Mexico as to be able to you know, paint a picture of what goes on in the region and maybe um, use that as a basic analysis for you know, where the debate should be going. Um, so the very first one, again, is, it's the dynamic of policies. And I do understand there's several people who come from the region here and that know probably these policies a little bit better than I do. And th that's why I will go really quick about this. Uh, so the very first one is Argentina. And uh, well, you've got the, the law number 23,737, uh, which punished possession of drugs for personal consumption with prison sentence, ranging from one month to two years. And it also included education or treatment measures as a substitute for those penalties. Uh, this law, as you may know, uh, was voted in the Supreme Court last August 25, 2009. And it was unan unanimously ruled unconstitutional, applicable to those cases of drug possession for personal consumption that does not affect others. The next one uh, that I will be very quickly overviewing is Brazil. Uh, Brazil has a law which cites in its Article 28, 28 whoever acquires, stores, transports, or possesses unauthorized drugs for personal consumption in violation with legal standards or guidelines shall be forced to comply with the following. A, warning about the effects of drugs, B, community service, and, and C, participation in a drug educational program. Um, so again, it gives a sense of, uh, that's why I entitled that slide, the pending decriminalization. It gives a sense of where Brazil is heading in that sense. The next one is Colombia, and Colombia is an interesting case right now. In 1994, the Constitutional Court declared unconstitutional the punishment for possession of amounts for personal use based on Article 16 of the Constitution uh, regarding individual liberty. Uh, since then, adults can actually possess up to 20 grams of marijuana and one gram of cocaine, among other substances, for consumption in the privacy of their homes. Uh, however, right now, or last year rather, Legislative Act Number 2, or that's how it was called in 2009, uh, in its Article 1, uh, it forbids any possession or consumption of drugs. Um, this act is currently sitting at the Colombian Constitutional Court and NGOs uh, and different organizations of civil society are you know, waiting for the court to review it. Next is Paraguay, uh, which has a law that dates back from 1988, and that in its Article 30 cites whoever possesses substances detailed in, the, in this law uh, prescribed by a doctor or whoever possesses them exclusively for personal consumption will be exempted from punishment. Um, again, drug users' exclusively personal use will be determined by the amount of substance in possession equivalent to what is considered a daily dosage or as determined by the forensic doctor and a, a specialized doctor. Uh, in the case of marijuana, this shall not surpass 10 grams, and in the case of cocaine, heroin, and other opiates, 2 grams. Uh, the next one is your why. The law dates back from 1974, and the phrasing of the 1974 uh, law uh, was updated in 1998, and it cites whoever is in possession of a reasonable quantity exclusively destined for personal consumption as morally determined by the judge who would have to include his reasoning for such ruling in the sentence will be exempted from punishment. Next one is Venezuela. Um, 
And Venezuela has in its organic law on psychotropic and neurotic substances in Article 75, and again I quote, personal dose is defined as no more than two grams in the case of cocaine and its derivatives, uh, mixed or composed with one or various ingredients, and up to 20 grams in the case of cannabis. Uh, Article 76, which follows, uh, says the following safety measures will be applied for the cases stated in the previous act. One, admission in a rehabilitation center specialized therapy. Two, cure or detoxification. Three, social reintegration of subject. Four, parole and monitoring upon release. And five, deportation of foreign non-resident subjects. Last but not least, uh, next one, is Mexico's current law. It comes, as you may know, from a decree called Narcomenudeo Decree, which was approved in August of 2009, and it reforms both the general health law and the criminal procedure code. Uh, the two particular articles that, in, that matter to, to, the, to the debate is 477 and 478. The first one punishes possession of drug control for personal consumption. It sets a table of maximum amounts that you may uh, possess for personal consumption. And if, uh, well, it, it, it uh, punishes that with up to 80 days of minimum wage fine or a prison sentence ranging from 10 months to three years and six months. Um, however, on Article 478, it allows for those facing criminal uh, charges for drug possession once it has been shown that it, was, it, had, it had no intent of uh, commercializing that, that, those drugs. Um, and so it was, it was meant to be for personal consumption uh, to be acquitted if they seek treatment. Um, it, after the third time of reincidence or after the third time of being caught, there will be no excuse uh, for criminal charge. Again, I will try to very quickly just focus on the costs of these strategies, in particular in the case of Mexico. Um, so, you know, I, I guess I, I don't want to state the obvious because all of you have heard quite a lot about it and many organizations in this room actually have um, put out a lot of reports around it. But, you know, there's always the figure of uh, what a frontal war in the case of Mexico has meant for the past four years. Um, you know, 35,000 plus deaths. Um, in, the in the sense of human rights violations, we heard yesterday for, from both TNI and WOLA about the, you know, the report of systems overload, overload, sorry, drug laws and prisons in Latin America. And uh, Human Rights Watch has also put out a, um, a report last December on uniform impunity looking at uh, violations of human rights by the military um, to civilians and how these cases may not be reviewed or have not been reviewed by courts, civil courts, of course. Uh, last but not least, the, again, stating the obvious, further criminalization and stigmatization of drug users, in particular um, those who are young. Uh, on the next slide, I just put a very, it's two figures coming up. Um, so the first one, I just thought it was interesting around the particular debate of the war on drugs in Mexico. Uh, this put vis-a-vis -vis, uh, per capita budget on security and law enforcement. So uh, on the bottom, you've got the different violence index uh, per state. At the very top one, I, I know it's very small, I'm sorry about that. On the very top, you've got Mexico City, and on the very right, you've got Chihuahua, which is um, you know, the state with Ciudad Juarez, one of the currently thought of or indexed as the most violent city in the world. Um, and, you know, going up, you've got how much money is put or how much money is invested in the security budget of, of those states. And I just thought it was interesting to see that on uh, first hand. On the second slide, uh, I tried to do a very quick, uh, again, vis-a-vis, -vis figure on budget expenditure versus health expenditure at a federal level. Uh, so, you know, in there you've got from 2007 to 2011, these are official figures from um, the Chamber of Deputies, and uh, you've got the percentages. So while you, you may see that the health budget in, it, in the official reports is still higher than the security budget, um, you know, the percentages are rather interesting. Um, for the first three, I think, uh, 2007, 2008, and 2009, you see that the security budget accounts for about one-third of the health budget. Um, however, for 
2009, I'm sorry, it's one third. 2010, it goes up to one third as well, right? And then 2011 is the, the appointed budget as approved by the, by the deputies. Um, again, it's just, I think, interesting to look at the percentages as to prove the, the case of, you know, where the political will or where the political decision of the country as a strategy is heading. Um, on, the, on the next slide, I, I basically state that, which is that but there is a budgetary tendency uh, that seems to not be necessarily uh, you know, sticking to the actual needs of the people. The last national poll of uh, addictions, which is called, which is from 2008, and it was put out by the end of 2009, um, you know, shows an increase, a quite big increase of uh, people who use drugs, yet you know, the strategy continues to be to grow the budget on um, security and uh, military forces rather than put it towards um, health agencies. Um, again, this whole story or, or this whole strategy of puts the needs of drug users, of course, it overcrowds, as it was explained yesterday by our colleague Pien, the judicial system, it confronts police forces with organized crime, and you know, if you do a very uh, basic look out of um, where our police forces are at, it is also very shocking to see you know, they're being put out to fight uh, against a, a, a series of institutions, organized crime institutions, that don't necessarily, um, you know, they're not ready to do so. Um, furthermore, it criminalizes most affected communities, as we know, in particular young people, uh, children, women, migrants, and of course, drug users. Um, I guess, you know, I would like to finish this uh, brief presentation by, you know, challenging the, the different governments in Latin America, of course, the different governments in the world, uh, challenging in general, you know, everyone, civil society, public opinion, uh, the media, to think if this is the kind of policies that we want for our future generations, if these are the kind of policies that we want for, you know, our different populations around the world, and, um, you know, if we shall consider changing some of the policies I talked about before. Again, thank you very much to Transform IDPC. Thank you.